Hello and welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's energy seminar. Um, glad to see you all here. Uh, we have a, a fantastic speaker today. To introduce our speaker, I'm going to call on Steve Egos, standing right here, who is the uh, director of the Energy Division and interim chief science officer at Slack. Got to get all the words right at Slack uh, National Accelerator which is a really cool place right up Sand Hill Road here. If you get a chance to visit it or take a tour there, take them up on it. As you'll see from Johanna's talk, it's a really cool place. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Steve to introduce our speaker for today, Steve. Thanks, John. Johanna Nelson Wecker is a lead scientist at Slack National Accelerator Lab and group lead for the hard X-ray material science group at the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source, SSRL. She's also an adjunct professor here at Stanford in the material science and engineering department and leader of the aptly named Wecker group at SLAC. Johanna got her bachelor's degree in math and physics from Mullenberg College, small liberal arts college in Pennsylvania, and her PhD in physics from Stony Brook University. Johanna came to Stanford and Slack in 2010 and hasn't left. <laughs> Johanna's research involves using x-rays to study a number of important problems in materials, including in energy storage, how to make greener batteries. She develops better x-ray tools for x-ray imaging and microscopy, and she works on selective separations for recovering resources and cleaning water. Johanna's assistant director of the Aqueous Battery Consortium, a large new energy storage consortium led by Stanford. And she recently received the prestigious Department of Energy Early Career Award to study three-dimensional imaging techniques for battery and other samples. Johanna's a popular lecturer associate editor of the Journal for Electrochemical Energy Storage. She's been a member of numerous professional committees and review panels, including several appointments as chairperson. She's been on the organizing committee of many conferences and workshops, and she has supervised and is supervising a large number of postdocs, grad students, and undergraduate interns, and she served on several PhD thesis defense committees. Her talk today is titled X-ray Characterization of Battery Degradation, or as I like to refer to it, when good batteries go bad. Please join me in welcoming Johanna Wecker. Thanks, Steve. If you ever need someone to introduce you, that was a great introduction. <laughs> So I'm very happy to be here today um, to talk to you about um, some of the research that my group's doing in um, energy storage, in batteries, um, and specifically using the x-rays we have at SLAC um, to characterize them. Um, so just a little introduction to SLAC if you have never made it up there. If you do want a tour, I'm happy to give you a tour. Um, this is um, a bird's eye view of uh, Stanford University, you can see over there, and then there's this long linear accelerator that actually goes under 280. Um, that is part of SLAC. Um, and um, this is another picture of SLAC, and you can see here, I don't think I have a pointer, um, but there's a round building there. Um, that is the synchrotron, Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source, or SSRL. Um, so I work there. Um, SLAC is funded by the Department of Energy. So um, we have um, uh, sort of continuous funding from the Department of Energy. We look at um, energy materials for the most part, um, but we're operated by Stanford University. And we're actually a, um, a I think a, a department of Stanford. Um, so we have a lot of Stanford um, postdocs, um, students, faculty working at SLAC. Um, it's just two miles up the hill. The Marriott shuttle gets, this, gets you there. Um, so um, that's where all this work that I'm gonna present has been done. More specifically, it's been done at SSRL. Um, so this is another view of the storage ring. Um, what is a synchrotron? A synchrotron is really just a big storage um, ring of electrons. It's, it's a building-sized x-ray machine 
where you get the x-rays from the electrons. And so the electrons go around in a circle. It's a quasi-circle. It's not actually quite a circle. There's straight sections. There's round sections uh, or bench sections. Um, and every time the electrons are accelerated, they're bent, um, you get a shower of x-rays. And so we use those x-rays, um, which are much, much, much more intense, um, more flux, more photons than you'd get in a lab source, um, to characterize materials. Um, we can characterize materials on many different end stations. Um, each of those blue or yellow lines is a different instrument. Each of them specializes in something different, and they can all work simultaneously. So it's about 30-some um, experiments that are going on simultaneously. We don't just serve ourselves or even Stanford. We actually have um, scientists from around the world who come to the synchrotron and do experiments for about two to five days, maybe up to a week or two. Um, you can, anyone can apply for beam time um, by submitting a proposal, a three-page proposal on what you want to do, why the science is cool, and why you need our synchrotron. Um, that is peer-reviewed. You're given a score, and depending on your score, you can get beam time. Um, and then there's a bunch of scientists who work full-time at the beam lines there to help other people complete their science. So they're the experts on each of those instruments, and they can help you um, or the other scientists perform the experiments that you want to perform. So everything else on this talk is going to be about batteries and how we can use those x-rays to characterize batteries. So I guess the first question is, why do we need to characterize batteries? And why do we need x-rays to characterize batteries? Um, so I don't need to tell you why we need batteries. Storing energy portably is really nice. We also need batteries not just for our laptops and our cars, but also for the grid. So we need to do continuously develop better, longer-lasting batteries. And I listed three things that are really important. Holding more charge, lasting longer, both in terms of how many cycles you can do, but also just the calendar, the length of time the battery is operating. Um, make them greener and cheaper, and that's a real focus recently, is, is how can we take the materials right now that are maybe not as green as we'd like and, can, and, and make them and replace them with other materials and make them recyclable. About 10 to 20% of lithium ion batteries right now are recycled. Um, so we definitely need to make all of them recyclable. So why do we characterize batteries, especially as they fail? Well, we want to know why they're failing, how they're failing, and so we can make better batteries. And we need to characterize them across different length scales. So batteries typically are on centimeter sized scale. Um, their electrodes are 100 microns thick. You have an anode and a cathode. You have a, a separator in between that's filled with electrolyte. Um, each of those anodes and cathodes, those electrodes, are comprised of particles that are on the micron scale. But those particles are actually comprised of things um, that are on the angstrom scale. So we want to study what's going on at the atomic scale, at the particle level scale, and also on the electrode scale. And really how those length scales compare to each other. What's going on at the angstrom scale that's causing something to happen at the micron scale or the millimeter scale, which ultimately fails the battery. Like I said, my group uses x-rays to characterize the batteries. And so we use x-rays to characterize across those length scales that I just talked about. And the beautiful thing about all the x-ray techniques that we have at a synchrotron is that we have different techniques that can all probe different parts. So I have a few examples up here at the top left. That's your left, right? Um, is a map of a full battery. Those are on millimeter scales. Um, the intensity on that map shows you where lithium metal has plated on an anode. This is a fast charged battery, and I'll talk about fast charging um, in a more specific example. Um, one of the issues with fast charging a battery, why don't we always go and plug Teslas into fast, their fast chargers, is because you have the run the risk of plating lithium metal on your anode rather than the lithium ions going into your metal, I mean, into your anode um, and intercalating into the graphite. And so here, without taking apart the battery, we're able to see where is the lithium metal plated onto your battery. Um, the 
next slide here, um, which is the green and red picture, um, combines chemistry and microscopy. And it's, so it's looking at multiple particles on a cathode and how when you're lithiating them, they are both breaking apart. So going from a micron sized particle to nano sized particles and also having a chemical reaction because um, lithium is going into the particles. And so we can actually look indirectly at where the lithium's going because of the chemistry changes. Um, those two images back there, I can start it again, are uh, movies. That's of an anode particles looking at a single particle um, in the lithiated state and a delithiated state in 3D. And you can see that um, when you have 3D information, you can see cracks forming in particles. And it's not just a crack, but it's completely separated. Um, so 3D information can be gained from x-rays. And then finally, looking at the atomic scale, um, this is fast charging um, uh, an electrode, a, a full battery. Oops. Here um, is diffraction patterns going up in time with the electrochemistry here. And you can see those squiggles in the diffraction patterns match the squiggles in the electrochemistry. So the changes as you're pushing lithium in and out of a layered structure, for example, you're gonna see the spacing of those lattices in the crystal changing as you're moving lithium in and out. And so we can actually see how repeatable, how reversible is that um, insertion and removal of lithium ions in that crystal. And so the X-ray diffraction allows us to um, very quickly probe what's the crystalline material doing at the angstrom level. And so we're able to study batteries with X-rays all the way from the battery millimeter scales all the way down to the chemistry, the crystal changes at the angstrom level with X-rays. Okay, um, so today I'm gonna focus mostly on, actually I think all on um, imaging, microscopy, X-ray microscopy, um, but on a multi-scale level. So both at the millimeter scale, looking um, at um, hundreds and thousands of particles and at the um, particle scale. And so I talked about how um, fast charging is bad on the anode side because you're not able to put the lithium inside the anode material, but it plates metal on top, which degrades the battery. Um, but it also can do things to the cathode. So um, on a follow-up study from the one that I showed you of that map, we wanted to look at what's happening with fast charging on the cathode. And so what's the degradation from extreme fast charging on the cathode? And fast charging we defined as 10 minutes charge to 80%, um, which is quite fast, I would say. Um, and, um, and then the second example I'm gonna talk about after the fast charging example is how we can um, design uh, new anode materials, anode architectures, and use X-ray microscopes to see how our design um, sort of works or doesn't work. So we came up with an idea. We think this will um, mitigate cracking in the particle. Let's test it with the microscope. And then we see that it doesn't work. We re reiterate on that. Um, so that's the second example I'm gonna go to. And that's gonna be on the particle level. Okay, so fast charging. Our past work, and it's right here, or in summaries right here, we mapped lithium, we mapped um, the state of, of graphite, and we also mapped um, two different batteries. Actually, we went out to a whole bunch of batteries, I think nine batteries, at different states of charge, and we found a connection between the amount of capacity lost during fast charging to the amount of lithium plating that we have. And so there's a loss of lithium inventory from lithium plating, um, and that completely was a linear um, correlation or um, com um, correlation between the capacity that we lost during fast charging. So as a follow-up, we wanted to see what the cathode was doing. And we wanted to use microcomputed tomography, 3D imaging, um, to look at thousands of particles. And I just told you how awesome the synchrotron is, but for this study, we actually used the lab um, micro CT here at Stanford. Um, so there's a complement to what you can do in a lab and what you can do at a synchrotron. And we use the lab one because of accessibility and also because the energy is higher. So you have fewer photons, but they're higher energy photons. So they can go through the material more, um, more easily. And um, 
the experiment takes longer because you have fewer photons. But in the end, um, if you're patient, you get the same results. Um, so we were able to track thousands of particles. And um, we we're comparing, basically, the pulverization of those particles um, with the cycling conditions we have. Um, OK, so here is sort of all of the 3D images that we have. And this is really hard to see anything um, when you're just looking at pictures. But it gives you an idea of what uh, states we did. So we did the formation cycle, which is just a bunch of slow cycles. Um, it's pretty standard. Every battery that comes out of a factory has been formed already. Um, and then we did a series of faster cycling. So 1C is one hour charge. 6C is 10 minute charge. And then we actually went up to 9C, which isn't quite the right way to calculate it, but it's a, it was a seven minute charge. Um, and we looked at it after 225 cycles and after 600 cycles. So um, really long-term cycling. Um, and you can't tell much from these. Each of those um, circles that you're seeing are individual cathode particles, and you're looking at about a millimeter um, distance, a uh, radial distance, a uh, diameter. Um, but now that we have this data, we can actually take it and do something with it. And so we're able to label every single particle in the 3D map. And what you find if you're doing this labeling is sometimes you'll mislabel a particle that's cracked in half. And so the computer doesn't know that it actually used to be two particles. Your eyes can see it very easily. For example, this one's a great, great one. Um, it's multiple particles, so it's cracked in multiple places. Um, and we actually allowed the computer to, to do those false um, labeling because we wanted to see that if we have an increase in the number of small particles, that means more fracturing. So we used that sort of mislabeling to help us determine how much fracturing we have in our, particle, in our electrodes. And so here's plots of frequency. So they're, they're histograms, essentially. Um, and the first thing we did was looked at the volume of all the particles. And um, this is just the total histogram. And we've highlighted three different regions. One is um, very close. Oh, so sorry. One is the um, smallest particles, medium particles, and largest particles. And we wanted to see where those were located in the thickness of the cathode, because we thought maybe particle cracking would happen more at the surface where the cathode is closest to the anode, because those are the ones that are going to be charged and discharged more easily because they're closer physically to the anode. We actually found no dependence in depth um, to the fracturing of the particles. So they're very randomly distributed. Um, so this sort of was a null result of we thought it might happen, but actually the cracking and the fracturing is happening uniformly throughout the depth of the electrode, which is a good thing. It means we're utilizing the full um, cathode. So the next thing we looked at was particle volume and um, for each of the cycling conditions. And so the um, density distributions of, of volume are here, um, the formation one, and then you can see the two different cycles. Uh, the 225 cycles or 600 cycles for each of those conditions as they get faster and faster. And the thing you notice is there's a bimodal distribution after you cycle. So the formation cycle has just one peak. There's a bimodal distribution in 1C, 6C, and 9C. And that distribution actually changes between the 225 and the 600. So you're going towards more smaller particles. Um, so there's an increase in smaller particles, no matter what your cycle rate is. Um, and there's a bimodal distribution. So actually, 1C and 6C have the largest increase in smaller particles after the 225 cycles compared to um, the 9C. 9C, actually, there's not much difference between 225 and 600. And so we uh, contribute, attributed that to the damage basically is already done at 225 cycles at 9C. And so those extra um, cycles don't actually contribute more to particle fracturing. Um, and then we can plot the cathode capacity fade, which we get electrochemically, um, with the cycle number at those different conditions. 
and we see that the, the trends do agree. There's more capacity fade, the more smaller particles. So we do think that particle fracturing does contribute to cathode capacity fade. So that's um, isolating the capacity fade from the anode, which is what we studied before. And so this is just looking at cathode capacity fade. And so why we would get cathode capacity fade when you're fracturing particles is probably as you're fracturing it, the electrical connection to those fractures is not as good as it was in the whole particle. OK, um, we also could track sphericity. Um, sphericity is basically how spherical something is. Um, and um, a perfect sphere is one. Um, so anything less than a sphere, which all of this is, um, is just less spherical than a sphere. So we start out with something pretty spherical. And we're moving towards actually things um, are less spherical after 225 cycles. And then they move to more spherical after 600 cycles, except for 9C. 9C, the damage is already done between 225 cycles and 600 cycles. There's not much change. And so what is going on? Well, we think as you get smaller particles, at first those cracks, sort of you're, you're just like breaking apart a big um, particle. Those cracked particles are not very spherical. But then those fractured particles further fracture, and they fracture into something that's more spherical. And so here, for example, is just sort of summarizing everything. We're starting out with very large spherical particles. We fracture into something that's not spherical. And then eventually, it further fractures, further polarizes into something more spherical. And so in this study, we're able to use the morphology of thousands of particles to track um, degradation in the cathode and relate that to the capacity loss in the cathode. Um, so I didn't show it, but we also did nano CT to look at individual particles and to see fractures actually within particles. Uh, I don't have time to go into that. Um, but for this study, actually, we got a lot of information by looking at a millimeter of material because we we're able to track so many particles. So we can get real statistical analysis of what's going on at the particle level. And we used volume and shape change as a proxy for damage. OK, um, so now I want to talk about something very different. On the anode side, um, we're exploring new anodes. Sorry. Um, so anodes right now are typically graphite. So they're made out of carbon. And this is a plot of theoretical capacity, both volumetric and gravimetric. So how much volume does it um, occupy versus how much, how much it weighs? Both things matter if you're in a vehicle. Volume really matters if you're trying to build something on the grid. Um, and so ca carbon is terrible. Um, and that's in every single battery in this room right now. If it's a lithium ion battery, you've got a carbon anode. Um, lithium is actually um, what people are mainly trying to do, lithium metal. Um, silicon is a great host for lithium. Um, it has a very large volumetric capacity. Um, but there are many problems with silicon. Um, and actually, those problems are the same with germanium and tin. This work is on tin, um, but we think that a lot of the um, results from this work could also be mapped onto to, to solutions for, for silicon anodes. Um, so the problem with these silicon, germanium, and tin anodes, which alloy with lithium, is when they alloy with lithium, they have this large volume change that allows them to accommodate this large capacity. But if you think about these large volume change as you cycle many thousands of times, no material can withstand that amount of 400% volume change um, you know, 2,000 times. Um, so it causes cracking and fracturing, very similar to what we saw actually in the cathode, um, but more extreme. And it also creates this unstable um, interface layer between the um, anode particles and the liquid electrolyte. And so you're constantly having to regrow this interface layer as you um, expose more silicon or tin to the electrolyte, because the electrolyte is not stable against these particles. Um, so one of the solutions that we um, 
discussed with our collaborators from um, UCLA is developing nanoporosity in these particles. And the idea is that a bulk material will fracture as you lithiate it, the nanoporous material will just close up those pores. And so it allows you to have the volume um, very locally to um, reduce um, the stress and allow those pores to close. And so you won't have this large volume change. Um, nanoporosity is actually really easy to um, make in these types of materials um, because you can de-alloy something. So here we started with tin magnesium and we etched out the magnesium. And so that allowed us to have pores on the 30 to almost 200 nanometer scale. Um, so that's a very scalable technique. And you can see here, there's a capacity plot versus cycle number up to 200 cycles. The nanoporous tin cycles very, very well. Um, no capacity lost really after 200 cycles, whereas the dense tin doesn't get you past 10 cycles. Um, and so we wanted to use X-ray microscopy to look at these um, anode materials while we cycle them. Um, mm -hmm. And so we used a pouch material, pouch battery, very similar to what you would use in a standard lab. And we can cycle these for um, tens of cycles, if not hundreds of cycles. Um, and we can use X-ray microscopy to see how those nanopores, which are shown here uh, um, with an X-ray microscope, um, change as you lithiate it. And so this is something you can't do with a TEM or an SEM because those are in vacuum. They're very surface sensitive. Um, you need very thin materials. So X-rays can penetrate through very easily um, these full batteries. Okay, so results. Um, this is our initial dense tin on top, and this is just looking at a single particle. Um, we actually did multiple fields of view. Um, Batteries actually cycle very slowly compared to how quickly you can take images. Um, so you can look at lots of different fields of view um, as you go. So the dense tin, um, we just have a yellow circle around it just to see the volume change um, more easily. It's actually aerial change because it's only a 2D image. Um, you can see basically nothing happens until the very end at the very low voltage and then suddenly the volume changes dramatically. You get a crack um, and um, sort of detrimental things happen. The, Bottom one is the nanoporous tin. And we were very disappointed to see that the shape of the nanoporous tin particle totally changes as you lithiate it that first cycle. Um, if you plot aerial expansion, and we're plotting only aerial expansion because it's a 2D image, so we don't know really what's going on in that third dimension. Um, those are the two materials. You can see the nanoporous tin does not have a very large volume expansion or aerial expansion and it goes back to its original after you delithiate it. Whereas the dense tin had this very burst expansion and then actually kind of just keeps its same area as you take the lithium out. And so there is a large change that's irreversible in the dense tin in that very first cycle that you don't see in um, as a volume or an area change in the porous tin, but we are definitely not keeping the morphology the same. So it wasn't a perfect solution. And that's what the x-rays could give us. Um, when we looked at the cycling data, it seemed like things were going well, but I think we can improve this. And so that's what we did. So we went back to our collaborators at UCLA and they're like, well, we can try an alloy. So antimony also lithiates, but it lithiates at a different voltage than tin does. And so if we create a tin antimony alloy, we'll have some of the atoms lithiating at one voltage, some of the atoms lithiating at a different voltage, and it'll be a more stable structure because you have this, this um, dual alloy, which is supporting your volume changes and supporting your, um, your structure as the other one alloys. And so the hypothesis was this intermetallic of tin and antimony is gonna be more stable than just the tin by itself. And so again, we took, this now we took a um, tin antimony alloy where we had a lot more tin and we etched out um, the excess tin. And so we got a alloy that was equal parts tin and antimony um, with nanopores. These pores are a little smaller for better or worse, um, but 
uh, sometimes you can't really control the size of the pores um, with this material. Um, but we do have cycling data, and we found that it cycles very well, this tin antimony alloy. And so we wanted to put it onto the beam line as well and see what imaging would tell us. And so this is one example of many particles of the tin antimony porous material. Um, and so you have, starting with the lithiation cycle, uh, you have a small volume expansion. We actually see some cracking at about 0.6 volts um, and 0.4 volts. So there is some cracking, which was a little disappointing, um, but not much aerial expansion. And then you returned to the area that we started with when we took the lithium out. We can plot that again. Um, so um, on top is just a different nanoporous tin. Uh, on the bottom is the nanoporous tin antimony. Um, and here are the three plots of aerial expansion. This is averaged over many particles. Um, and you can see that bulk expansion, the, the, the burst expansion from the bulk tin, um, but the nanoporous materials both follow the same trend. So they look on a aerial expansion to be the same, but you can see the nanoporous antimony and tin together preserve the shape, the overall um, micron sized particle. Um, so we wanted to also look and see what's happening at the nanoporous material, so the nanopores. So if you take a thin region um, near the edge of the particles, you can actually see the pores. Um, and on top is the pores um, for the nanoporous tin. On the bottom is the nanoporous tin antimony. You can see the pores are starting out smaller, so that might help as well. The nanoporous tin antimony, the pores fill in when you lithiate it, and they're preserved, and they come back when you delithiate them. Whereas up top, you see the nanoporous tin. When you lithiate it, those pores just became hundreds of nanometers rather than 50 nanometers. And that got even worse when you delithiated. So we think it's on the pore level um, that's the problem with the porous tin. The porous tin can't maintain that nanoporous structure. It's losing the nanoporosity, and um, the nanoporous tin antimony is actually able to preserve that. So we think it's due to the fact that we have this dual alloy. We have this um, tin N antimony, which can lithiate at different voltage. You can also plot the average pores um, and see that um, graphically as well. So, um, I told you that these part of cells can last um, tens to hundreds of cycles, which is really important if you want to study not just the very first cycle, but you want to cycle for a while and see what happens, for example, on the 36th cycle. So we took this battery, cycled it at UCLA um, for 35 cycles. A grad student drove it up <laughs> from UCLA, and we looked um, with the X-ray microscope at what the 36th cycle looked like. We were happy to see that we have nice distinct particles. So this is the tin antimony again. We still have those nice distinct particles that we saw um, in the pristine material. And we have still a small volume change or aerial change. Um, you can see if you plot the aerial expansion, the first ones, it's a different battery, different particles. Um, but the first one is plotted there as a solid line. Um, the open circles are the 36. So the, the aerial expansion is less but it is still consistent. Um, and it's actually probably going back to sort of the normal amount. Um, so it's, it's always slightly less expanding than the first one. So less expansion than the first cycle, but it's still being able to uh, expand and contract without cracking. Um, and so really being able to have a cell that you can put into a microscope that is working like a real cell in a, in a lab where it cycles for hundreds of cycles is really important if you want to just not study the first cycle. Um, and you can also look at the pores. And still, we're seeing the filling in of pores when we lithiate and the pores reappearing when we delithiate. So it seems to be cycling really, really well and really stably. Um, so the last thing we did, um, and this is my last example, is we went back to the drawing board and said, OK, Let's scrap nanoporosity. Maybe we don't need that. Maybe we've got other ideas. 
And so um, this is collaborators from UC Santa Barbara. Um, and they had come up with this way of balling, ball milling the material, um, the tin antimony, so it's still a dual alloy, um, with bismuth. And it created bismuth grain boundaries. And so you can see on that cryo um, stem image, bismuth is really sitting at the grain boundaries between um, the, the crystals. Um, you can also see that here um, in the EDS. And so this ball milling um, was believed to help the cycling. Um, so they saw that electrochemically, it was cycling better, but we wanted to also see that and confirm it with the X-ray microscope. And so here you can see the electrochemistry. Um, the blue one is uh, the stable capacity with the bismuth. The red one is just ball milling without the bismuth, but with carbon. Um, and you can see it falls it. Um, after about 100 cycles, um, it really decreases. And so there's still images are here. There's a movie as well here. You can see there's an expansion during the lithiation um, of these materials, just like we had in the nanoporous material. And the, and the, um, it was a continuous growth of um, expansion rather than like in the dense tin where it was a burst expansion. And you see no cracking at all. And so what we think is these bismuth enriched grain boundaries are allowing the grains as they expand to slide past each other. It's kind of like steel um, where um, you get a lot of structural integrity because of the grain boundaries and, and, the, and the architecture of the grain boundaries. Um, and so we think, yeah, it's like a liquid-like interface between the different grains of the structure. And so each of those grains are expanding as you lithiate and pushing against each other, but they're allowed to slip past each other rather than cracking. Um, so we also were able to do this in 3D. So we can do 3D imaging. Um, I showed you one example of that on the nanoscale. Um, it's hard to do 3D imaging in a real operating battery. It's possible, but hard. Um, so here we wanted to get really good data. So we actually just harvested the batteries. And so this is just looking at two different particles, one from the bismuth on the left and one without the bismuth on the right. And if you take just a single slice of the 3D volume, you can see there's a lot more cracking after 20 cycles um, in the particles without bismuth versus there's just one crack we found in the particles with bismuth. Um, and so with the combination of operando in situ uh, 2D imaging and ex situ 3D imaging, you can really get a good idea of why um, the architecture that you're choosing is able to help mitigate the, the cracking and give you a long cycle life. Um, so just as summary, we, we explored nanoporosity, which gave us sort of the um, preservation of the um, total aerial expansion, um, but destroyed the sort of morphology. But um, with nanoporous intermetallics, we were able to preserve both um, the nanoporosity um, at the, the, the local structure, but also the large uh, micron sized par particle size. Um, and then the interventional engineering allowed us to really do that as well without the nanoporosity. So there's many options when you wanna be designing these um, novel anode materials. So in summary, um, we looked at tomography on the cathode and used the, um, the, the morphology changes, the volume size, and the sphericity as a proxy for particle damage and related that to um, the capacity on the cathode as you fast cycled it, the loss of capacity. And then we used operando at microscopy um, to really look directly at particles to see how our anode architectures designs um, were really manifested um, in real space. Um, so we could look at the how they were um, improving the battery cycling, but now we can also look at the morphology changes and if they're really doing what we think they're doing. So just a thanks to the funding. Um, the first project was funded um, by Excel, um, which was an extreme fast charging cell evaluation of lithium ion batteries project um, with collaboration from Argonne National Lab and Idaho National Lab. And then the second project um, with the anodes was funded by Scalers, um, which was an Energy Frontier Research Center funded by um, DOE as well, um, led by UCLA. And then finally, thanks to my group um, 
And thank you. I'm happy to answer um, any questions you have. Thanks, Johanna. That was great. Questions for Johanna? Yes, let's start here first. Uh, I think the room can hear you if you just touch speak up. Okay, good. Uh, thanks, Johanna. Very exciting and amazing presentation. So I have a question in terms of the uh, degradation. So when you use the X-ray uh, to investigate the uh, degradation of the animal site, mm -hmm. so you didn't mention about uh, the SEA glows. So I just wonder how do you think of the SEA layer? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, so the SEI layer, the solid electrolyte interface, um, is on the nanometer size, um, and it is made up of materials that are very close in uh, chemistry to the electrolyte. Because we're doing this in situ, it is impossible, I would say, to see this SEI layer because the X-rays look at electron density, and the electron density is identical to the electrolyte, electrolyte. And so it is very low in contrast. And so it's not visible. Mm -hmm. So when you're picking out a tool, you really need to think about what you want to study and pick the right tool for that. What about the uh, data listen? So people always say the data listen layer. So have you always? So data listen, data. Dead lithium? Yeah. Um, so lithium is also so the higher up you go in the periodic table, the harder it is to see with an X-ray. Um, so lithium is very difficult to see. Um, and that's why we used um, the lithium mapping that I showed you at the very beginning is um, using X-ray diffraction to study the dead lithium. And so you can see lithium is crystalline, so you can see with diffraction where lithium is and map it out um, in real space by moving your sample through the beam. Yes, here. Yeah, so because of these processes, for, for instance, nanoporosity, how recycling mm -hmm. gets impacted of the batteries. Yeah, so I really didn't talk about recycling because that's more something that we're starting to think about. So these are little older projects. Um, one, so it doesn't. None of this, what I showed you, affects recycling. Our first project looked at sort of the type of battery that's on the market right now. The second one um, looked at novel nanomaterials, but it didn't go beyond the problem we have where these are composite materials and they're made up of metals, carbons, um, polymers, and it's really hard to recover all that material. Um, and so typically we're burning things right now. Sometimes we can take out the, the electrodes, or not the electrodes, the current collectors, um, but it's a lot of work. So it, it's not something we're focusing on right now, but other people are. And I think the thing to start with would be maybe how does recycled graphite on the anode side function compared to pure graphite that you've you know, mined and then purified? Um, so, yeah. So recycling's hard. Recycling's hard. <laughs> Is there any sample damage due to the high energy X-ray? Great question. You should always think about what your probe is doing to your um, sample. Um, and when you're doing things operando and they're, they're dynamic systems, it's very difficult to distinguish between what your probe is doing and what you are seeing electrochemically. So what we do to sort of understand the damage level for any new type of sample is we will put the same amount of dose on the sample without the electrochemistry. So I will put a battery in, image it um, in an equivalent way that I would when I'm doing it in situ. And I would say, yes, we are doing damage, but not at the resolution we can see. Uh, so in your opinion, so to improve the battery performance, do you think it's mainly like a materials challenge or like a design challenge for batteries for like how we charge the batteries? Yes to all three. I think which is the most important? Um, it depends on what you want to do. I think for getting higher capacity, it's often a design problem. So for the anodes, we had a material like tin that has a higher capacity than what we currently have graphite. 
but now it's a matter of designing that electrode to cycle for longer. For fast charging, it's often a matter of knowing how fast your battery can handle and staying below that. So that's more of a battery management problem, especially when you have a series of batteries. Uh, and I can't remember the third thing you had said. Uh, the materials designed Material. how we charge the battery. Yeah, yeah. So I think if you're picking materials that are maybe greener or more easily recycled, um, for example, zinc ion batteries, we already have a recycling stream for zinc ion batteries. Um, we don't have rechargeable zinc batteries, but we have primary batteries that can be recycled. Um, so zinc is a lot easier to recycle, but we haven't gotten a rechargeable zinc battery that works like a lithium ion battery. And so when you're picking new materials, you have to think of the other things as well. Shahan, I have a question for the scalar work, yeah. for the uh, antimony tin one. You show one of the TXM images with the yellow color, like yeah. coloring. Did you all do the 2D zines for it? So like, you know, for instance, like the KH for antimony and the tin. Uh, for the KH to see whether the tin or antimony even move or migrate uh, yeah. within that structure? Um, that's the problem with having your student in the audience. <laughs> so you can't get to the tin edge on a microscope. So um, if I go back to this slide, um, the combination, the second image here, where it's red and green, red turning to green, combines spectroscopy, X-ray spectroscopy with X-ray microscopy. Um, we do that by going to an absorption edge of the material. And then you can get the chemical information by scanning the X-ray energy across that edge and fingerprint that spectrum to the chemistry you know. So we did that on cobalt. We can do it on, on first row transition metals. On tin, we can't do that um, because it's we can't access that X-ray energy on the microscope. Moreover, an alloy material doesn't have as distinct a shift of the edge. So there's not a distinct fingerprinting you can do on alloy materials. It's not as easy as like a metal oxide where you're changing oxidation state. More questions? Maybe following on a previous question, you, you put up some ambitious targets about fast charging. So how do you think about what it takes to get from where you are now mm -hmm. to there? And part of that would be how interested are people who actually make batteries and so on in what you're doing now? It's a yeah, slide yeah, Thanks. yeah. So um, People are really interested. So industry is very interested in getting fast charging to work. Um, as the project progressed, progressed, battery chemistries are changing so quickly that as the, the project was only three years, as the project progressed, we actually got battery companies being like, you're not, you're not studying the most relevant ca um, cathode and anode. They wanted us to put silicon in the cathode um, mixed with carbon and graphite. They wanted us to go to a, uh, a lower cobalt um, cathode material because that's what they were starting to put in. And we're like, well, we start, we picked our, our material two years ago and we wanted to stay consistent. And so we were being po constantly pushed by industry to study what's most relevant right now. Um, ways to make fast charging work. What we found from this project is um, there's, so the, the major issue is the anode. The cathode actually performs better with fast charging. And because the cathode degrades mostly when it's at high voltage. And with fast charging, you don't actually spend that much time at high voltage. You get there and you're done. Um, so slower charging can actually be more detrimental to the cathode. But there's major problems on the anode because you have lithium metal plating onto the, cath uh, onto the anode. It forms dead lithium, which means it doesn't dissolve back into um, the electrolyte and go to the cathode. So it's become lost lithium metal. Um, ways to do that is to improve the kinetics. You can improve the kinetics by changing the electrolyte. You can also dramatically improve the kinetics of the anode by um, 
doing things with porosity. So we explored um, coating dual layers of the anode material. So making a um, very dense uh, layer at the bottom near the current collector with small particles, small anode particles that had a, a smaller packing density essentially. And then on top, make a slightly porous layer um, with larger particles. And so you could get electrolyte in, infiltrated into the whole anode material and utilize the anode better because what we found is we were just utilizing the top you know, mi um, few microns of anode material. Um, you can also think about drilling holes in your anode or designing some porosity like that. Um, we always thought for this, not only do you have to come up with a solution, but the solution has to be scalable as well. I know you've got a lot of battery research programs that you didn't have a chance to talk about this afternoon. I bet the audience would love hearing about at least a couple of the other things you're doing on batteries and energy storage. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I'll talk about the aqueous battery hub since you mentioned it at the very beginning. Um, so newly funded um, energy um, what, energy innovation hub from DOE, um, and we're really focused on um, a very, very cheap alternative to lithium ion batteries for grid-based storage. And so um, to make a very cheap battery, you need to replace everything with cheap material. Um, so the electrolyte we're replacing with um, an aqueous electrolyte, water is cheap, um, and we're trying to find um, salts for that electrolyte that are also cheap. Um, on the cathode side, we are going to manganese oxide or even better, iron oxide. I mean, how, how more cheap can you get than rust? Um, on the cathode, on the anode side, we're looking at metals, um, a zinc metal or an iron metal or manganese metal. Um, and the real idea on this is that during charging, you're going to dissolve both the anode and the cathode completely into the electrolyte. And then on the reverse, you're gonna plate those, the metal oxide and the metal on the anode and cathode back. Why we would do that is that for lithium ion batteries and any batteries we're seeing right now that I've showed you, um, your anode and your cathode are lithium hosts. And so it's a structure like graphite or silicon or tin where lithium goes into it. If you had a pure metal, lithium metal or zinc metal, um, you don't need a host. So there's no volume for your host. There's no weight for your host that um, degrades your, your um, gravimetric capacity or your volumetric capacity. Um, so people do that on the lithium side. Lithium metal batteries is something that people are really starting to, to try to work out and make commercial. Um, but nobody's really thinking about it much on the cathode side. And so we want to also do it on the cathode side, where we're not using the cathode as a host, oftentimes a layered structure where you're just sticking lithium ions in, in between the layers, but we want to completely dissolve it and use all those ions for their energy. And so that's sort of a radical idea. Um, it is basic energy science funded, so we are allowed to think of radical ideas that may or may not work. Um, but I think even in a project like that, and this has, I don't remember how many, 13 institutions, 15, 13, 13 institutions. Um, you have so many smart people working on this project and, and really like the idea is like the Manhattan Project. You put enough scientists on one project thinking really hard about it, you're gonna revolutionize something. And so even if we don't make this final battery work, we are gonna come up with great new electrolytes, great new anodes and cathodes, um, which will spin off into something that's commercially viable. Great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Please join me in thanking Johanna one more time.